Hey folks, everybody ready for some more workshop? <laughs> Way too many years than I recall anymore, our former president, Barb Schuler, said, we ought to have one of our board meetings over near Indianapolis because there's this wonderful place. You remember what it was? No, but I'm oh. We like wonderful places. Let's hear it for wonderful places. And Brian and John Skaggs and a great guy with Sonny or somebody on the banjo and girl singers and Sandy. Sandy. Sandy, Reiner. Sandy Reiner. And it was just the greatest vaudeville kind of show that you could imagine. We've lost track or some of those people aren't around anymore. But this guy later became the three-time champ of this contest, mentored years before by one of our original three-time guests, uh, champs, Dorothy M. Harold of LaPorte, Indiana. And she won, she was our second champ starting our third year, Joy Bell Squibb. You may remember June Squibb, the actress. She played uh, on the uh, Big Bang Theory, she played Grandma. Nima when she came to town. That was Joy Bell Squibbs, our first champ's daughter who became an actress. Anyway, Dorothy Harold told me one time, so glad she'd mentored Brian Holland because he turned out to be such a stellar guy. And she said, and he's smart, way smarter than I am, she said. Because when her husband died in the 60s, 1960s, they got a joint plot and they put his name on it and the year he died and they put her year, 19, whenever she was born and they just put 19. <laughs> she expected not to be the world champion or get on uh, the Tom Snyder Tomorrow Show. So 20 years to the year that she was a three-time champion in our contest, Brian Holland, a good friend of the contest, and my friend won for his third time. Would you welcome a great guy and a great musician, Brian Holland. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ted. What's that? It was called the Bogstown Inn and Cabaret. And I'm actually going to talk about Bogstown here in a little bit. Carlos Gray, yes. Carlos Gray was the owner of that. We're going to actually get into that. I, this is, that's kind of cool. That's a blast from the past. I didn't expect anybody to remember that. Um, well, thank you guys for being here. This is outstanding. I'm so, I'm so thrilled. Thank you, Ted, for, for having me. Thank you, Ian. I don't know if Ian's in here, but thank you for, for inviting me this year. Um, you know, the only thing that's been better of, about perf than performing in, in this contest has been able to judge it. Uh, I think this might be my fourth time. Fourth time judging? I'm not sure, but it's been a few times, so. Twelve. Twelve? Well, no, but I mean, because I, I won in 97, 98, 99, and at the time, I was the youngest three-time champion, and then that record was quickly obliterated by, I think, Adam Swanson, um, who was much younger than I. But anyway, uh, so some of you may be a little bit confused about the title of my presentation, Playing Second Fiddle to Everyone. Um, a lot of that kind of goes back, actually, to the Bogstown days. Uh, but before we get into that, and I, I will tell you that um, there's a couple things you should know about this. First of all, uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is very autobiographical, a little bit about my life. Uh, and I also, while I'm talking and thinking about these things, I wander. So uh, I'll be across the stage probably about a thousand times before this is over with. Um, no lie, one time, you, how many people know the drummer that I work with, Danny Coots? So when the, pandem when the pandemic, I don't know if you guys heard or not, we had a pandemic. It's kind of odd. I think it was just in Nashville. But um, when the pandemic kind of happened, um, one time I was on the phone with Danny, and uh, I'm just kind of, as I usually do, I'm wandering around, and I decided to go outside, and I'm walking outside. And before I know it, and I'm, I'm in an adjoining neighborhood, and I'm walking into this, like, green belt, and I'm walking along. And by the time I got done with this, like, hour-long conversation, I was four miles from home. <laughs> it's no, no exaggeration, no lie. But anyway... Um, so, but before I really get started into all that, um, 
I just want to play something for you because I always think it's best to, to start with some music. And also because when we get into the, the actual performing part of this later on uh, in the workshop, um, I will actually be playing that piano because uh, that is the, what we call the second fiddle piano. Uh, and Sonny Leyland will be on this prime piano. So I'm going to play this one because I won't have a chance later. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a tune I wrote called Scram. I wrote it for my dog um, several years ago. Um, yeah, I had a, we have a dog named Henry, and when we had Henry first, he was just a little pup. And I remember sitting in, the, in my piano room practicing one day, and uh, Henry was in the kitchen with my wife, and just being a puppy, and just kind of all around her feet and so forth. And I remember she was kind of in there just screaming things at him, and one of the pervasive words was scram. And so I started just kind of noodling and playing this soundtrack behind what I was hearing in the kitchen, and so it turned into that. So that, that's scram. <laughs> so, um, wow, you're probably wondering why I called you here today. We, this, this contest has been really, really wonderful to me. The first time I, I came to the contest and performed, I think it was in 92. Um, 
and I, I spent uh, quite a few years trying to figure out what, what to do, how to make it happen. Um, I, I just kept, you know, landing in like sixth place, seventh place. I couldn't break top five, didn't know what I was doing wrong. And um, there were three gentlemen who kind of came along and took me under their wings. It was Professor Bill Edwards, Marty Mincer, and uh, Mark Lutton. And they said, look, here's what you're doing wrong. Now, I'm not going to tell you what, he, what they told me because there's some contestants in here right now. And I don't want to give anybody an edge. <laughs> but I will tell you this. They did give me some very valuable information. It is things I, 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 I carry with me to this day. And it really just has to do a lot about what we're going to talk about today um, in some regards. And, and just being in the moment. So when I say playing second fiddle, I'm talking about my, my formative years, basically, playing um, as a, as a accompanist, as a second pianist, um, someone who was not in the spotlight, but someone who was, whose job basically was to make other people sound good. Um, and it's, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful lesson. Um, I grew up with my grandparents. Um, my father was in the Air Force, and so I grew up in Indianapolis. And my grandfather was somewhat musical, but not really. I mean, he, he played by ear. And he knew a handful of tunes. We had a, a, an old Lowry organ. Um, we didn't have a piano at first. We just had an old Lowry organ. And so I would sit at the age of three with headphones on, and I would kind of noodle, and I would teach myself what each thing sounded like. And I would hear um, uh, jingles on TV, commercials. And I was able to kind of pick them out. So the very first song I ever played in my entire life was this. the Meow Mix theme song. So that was where I got started. And um, I, I spent all my time when I wasn't, you know, I mean, at three and four and five years old, what, what are you doing? And basically I was, you know, if I wasn't in the, uh, playing with my blocks or my Lincoln Logs, where I was like, working, I was playing. And so I got uh, lessons uh, on organ uh, when I was six. And my organ teacher finally said, look, we really need to get you on piano. And so um, at the age of seven, my grandmother, and I still don't know to this day how they managed it because my grandmother and grandfather raised both my brother and myself on his retirement from, the, from Amtrak uh, and their social security. So we didn't have a lot, but she got me a piano. And it was an old Kohler and Campbell console piano. Uh, and so I started taking piano lessons. Um, at the time, we you know, didn't really have enough money to, to pay a, a teacher. But luckily enough, in Indianapolis, and if you guys remember Indianapolis, uh, the, the Ragtime Festival there, you might remember the names Jim and Barbara Atkinson? No, okay, well, Jim and Barbara were big names in the, in the Hoosier Ragtime Society, which later became the Classic Ragtime Society. And Jim was kind of my mentor, and he said, look, I wanna teach you what I know about piano, and so he took me under his wing and kind of gave me be beginner piano lessons. Now, the great thing about what Jim and Barbara did is they were a piano duo. They would play two piano ragtime arrangements. He would be the accompanist, and she would play the, the melody line, the, the main part, if you will. And so he was very in tune with how to accompany, because that was what he did. And so not only did I learn, you know, all the scales and all the things that come with, you know, the charity and the Hannon and all that kind of stuff, but I was learning lessons from him on how to accompany um, and how to, well, I mean, rule number one is listening. If you're playing a second piano to anybody or if you're playing for a singer or if you're playing for a horn player or whatever, the most important thing you can do is listen. Because if you just sit down and start playing like you're a soloist, um, that's not what the person standing up here wants. That's not what the person who is featured wants. Your job is to make them sound better, um, to be as musical wallpaper as you can be. So um, now, the, the thing with my youth was that you know I was getting these beginner lessons from Jim, um, who was going through the basics and so forth, the scales and so forth. But after a couple of years, he said, look, I've really taken you as far as I can take you. I want to introduce you to his, to my, my teacher, who was from Stuttgart, Germany, a lady named Gerda Fischer Clay. Um, she had been the pedagogy professor at the University of Stuttgart, I believe, for a while. And so I started teach, or learning the classics from, from Gerda. 
Um, so I was privately taught for uh, about 18 years. Um, and I, I want to illustrate this for any of the students um, who may balk at the practice time, because I know sometimes getting practice time in is a little bit laborious, and finding time throughout the day can be you know, a pain to do that, and sometimes you just don't want to. Uh, and I totally understand that. I mean, I, I liked playing the piano, so it was easier for my grandmother to get me to practice than it was for her to get me to go outside and play basketball. I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to play. So I want, I want to go through real quick what my typical schedule was, um, uh, like during my school years. So at 6 o'clock, I'd get up in the morning, and I would start practicing. I'd practice scales for an hour. So that was from 6 to 7. Then at 7 o'clock, I'd eat breakfast. Uh, 7.30, I'd shower, I'd get ready for school. 8 o'clock, you go to school. Uh, then I'd come home about 3.30 in the afternoon. At 4 o'clock, I'd start my homework, or whenever I got home. Usually it was only about a 15, 20-minute walk from the school. So I'd do my homework. Uh, at 5 o'clock, I would then practice two more hours. At 7 o'clock, we'd have dinner. And that would give my grandmother time to fix dinner and have everything ready and so forth. And so at 7 o'clock, we knew every night. That was when dinner time happened. I'd eat dinner. Uh, I got some free time at 7.30 depending on how things were going. Uh, and then either at 8 or 8.30, I would finish my homework if I had any left, and I would practice until bedtime. So typically, on, an, on a normal day, it was anywhere from three to four hours. That was every day. And on the weekends, obviously, I could knock it out in the morning and be done with it. Um, but that was one of the requirements of Miss Gerda Fisher Clay. She's like, you will practice at least three hours a day. And of course, as, as a kid, I mean, at eight years old, I'm like, but when? I don't have that kind of time, but you can make that time. You know, you just have to be creative. Um, then at the age of about 12 or so, I, I got really involved in ragtime because of Jim and Barbara and the Hoosier Ragtime Society. Um, I guess depending on who you ask, either fortunately or unfortunately that happened. Uh, Gerda was not a fan, I can tell you that. Um, she did not like the fact that I was playing anything other than classical. Um, but I got hooked. I got absolutely hooked because Jim one day uh, I think I was practicing on some uh, WC or something, and he said, you know, you really like this kind of music. He said, do you know what ragtime is? And I said, nope. And he said, okay. And so he put the maple leaf, maple leaf rag in front of me. And he said, say, read this. So I sat down, and I, I fumbled through it. You know. But it was unlike anything I'd ever played. I mean, the syncopation of that is just odd the first time you play it. You don't understand what what it's supposed to sound like, and are you doing it right? Is that what it's supposed to be? And he assured me it was. And so I, I got kind of intrigued by that, and I got very hooked on what ragtime was. And so that was the beginnings of, the beginnings of my ragtime obsession. Um, I wouldn't say the end of my classical obsession, because I still continued to take classical lessons and study the classics, but I wasn't nearly as invested at that point. I think for me, the biggest thing was in, in ragtime, and it, it maybe, I mean, at the time, it was probably not the case, because I know we have what we call the ragtime Nazis back then. We're like, you can't do this. But um, I, you could improvise. You could play, if you play you know, Maple Leaf Rag or you play The Entertainer or whatever, it's okay to improvise. It's okay to make it your own. You can do that, and nobody frowns upon it except for the ragtime Nazis. But it's okay. <laughs> There's, there are fewer of them than there are of us. So I got to do that where, I mean, there were times when, you know, something would happen in a Mozart piece and I'd be inspired and I just would want to do something other than what he wrote. And it was like, you can't do that. You can't mess with the classics. This is what he wrote. This is his. Even though Mozart was very big on improvisation, you know. Um, but nonetheless, that's one of the reasons that I got so involved in ragtime and just really kind of never looked back. So at that time, at the age of 12, you know, I've, I've learned the maple leaf rag, I've learned a couple other rags. You know, I'd known a handful, well, more than a handful, I'd known quite a few um, old standard tunes that my grandfather used to play, things like Five Foot Two, Ain't She Sweet, Yesterday That's My Baby, you know, Ain't We Got Fun, that stuff. So I had already had those in my repertoire from listening to my grandfather and playing with him on the organ and the piano. And so there was a place called the Bogstown Inn and Cabaret that opened up in Bogstown, Indiana. Uh, it's about, I think, 30 miles due south of Indianapolis proper. And it is literally in the middle of a cornfield. Um, it's an old building that had been uh, a home. It had been a barbershop. It had been a grocery store. It had been any number of things. And it sat empty for a number of years. 
and Carlos Gray, who owns or owned Gray, well, he still does it probably, I don't know, he may have sold it off, but Gray Seed, uh, and he bought the thing, bought the, the building, and he turned it into the, rag, the Bogstown Inn and Cabaret. So at the age of 12, I got hired to play at the Bogstown Inn and Cabaret. And they would do shows Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, and Sunday matinees for bust-in crowds. And so my schedule then changed a little bit, obviously. So obviously the Mondays and Tuesdays, you know, when I was at home, it was that same schedule. But when I started working at Bogstown, everything stayed the same up until I got home from school. And then uh, at four o'clock, four o'clock I'd practice an hour. Uh, at five o'clock, I'd get changed into my costume because everything, everybody was dressed in the, you know, the, the, uh, the striped shirts and the vests and the garters and, you know, you had to play, play the part. So I get dressed and my grandmother would drive me in her uh, 73 gremlin uh, <laughs> to the Bogstown Inn and Cabaret. Um, at seven o'clock, the show would begin and there were usually at least a half a dozen performers, maybe more, sometimes less, but most of the time there were about a half a dozen or so. So I wasn't playing the whole time. But what I would do is I'd get there and at the musician's table, which was right next to the stage, that's where I would do my homework for the evening. And so I would do my homework as the show was kind of going on. And luckily enough, Carlos uh, was a, prof a former professor in mathematics. And so I got a lot of help when I needed it, which was great. But I would sit there and do my, my homework and I would go play and there were, there were two pianos side by side that were facing the audience. So imagine this is me playing the piano here. There's a piano next to me here. I'm facing the audience here. This is like a supper club. Above us was a mirror that went all the way across. So, and it was angled so that everybody out here could see our hands. So that's where I got my first experience playing second piano, truly. You know, the on-the-job training, because I was playing for singers. I was playing, as Ted mentioned, you know, we had a banjo player named Sandy Reiner. I love Sandy. Um, that, man was, that man was old back then. He's probably still alive. He's just mean enough. Um, he, yeah, we, we had just a great time. I learned so much. Uh, I play for singers, play for other piano players. Um, but you learn um, basically how to just be in the background, but do it tastefully, you know. Um, some, of, some of the things that I learned about playing with other pianists or other musicians in general um, is that, you know, if you ever watch a two piano act, and, and I'll have bring something up here in a little bit, we'll do a couple things. Um, but you'll notice that it, sometimes, if we, if we do it correctly, it seems seamless, what we're doing. A lot of times we're communicating, right? actually all the time we're communicating, if we're doing it right. Um, but most of the time it's, it's signals that maybe you're not seeing if we're doing it correctly, it's kind of surreptitious. It's, you know, we don't want everybody to see behind the curtain necessarily. But I'm going to show you behind the curtain a little bit today. Okay. So if we're doing a, like a key change, okay, how many people are musicians enough to know keys? Okay, good. This may not make sense to the rest of you. Just hang on, I'll get to something else. But if we're in the key of G, let's say, and one of the players wants to go to the key of B flat, we might do this. Anybody know what this means? Two flats. Very good. And the fact that I'm pointing down means flat. Uh, now, here's the strange thing. Is that depending on who you're working with, this could mean the key of G. This could mean one more time. <laughs> this could mean a lot of things. And so you kind of need to know who you're dealing with uh, beforehand. There are a lot of signals that, that we you know, will we'll use um, if, you, if we want somebody to go to the bridge, we we'll would do this, we might do this, bridge of the nose. Um, it's just a signal to say, okay, go to the bridge next here. Um, I, some band leaders will go like this to end the song. Some people will go like this to end the song, which actually that one I've never understood because to me this means one more time, keep looping. But I've had band leaders where they do this and everybody stops. I'm like, oh, I guess I was supposed to stop playing. So again, it's, it's, it's about knowing who you're working with uh, and what signals they use because depending, I think a lot on, on location and, and where they were uh, working you know, primarily, and folks on the East Coast used a little bit different signals than folks on the West Coast. So depending on where you are, that's the kind of stuff you would want to do. Um, what else we got? Breaks, you know, a lot of times we just do this, this. Um, 
we just a lot of times point, a lot of times there's, there's uh, mouth signals. This is what made the pandemic really tough, by the way. Because when you're up on stage and you're wearing a mask, I can no longer mouth things to my piano guy. Because usually it's like, you know, I'll say, you know, yours or you take it or out or whatever. And that was just, <laughs> and they weren't getting it. So yeah, it was a little rough. So I'm kind of glad we don't have to wear the mask anymore. But nonetheless, um, you always find ways. Um, I feel like I'm, I am kind of joining on. We're gonna, I'm going to get, wrap this up because um, I want to bring Sonny out and I want to do a couple of things with him to kind of show you um, some of the things that we do as two pianists and what, uh, what this second piano really does. So if you would, please put your hands together for Mr. Sonny Leyland. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this for now. Um, I'll give it back to you in a second. I'm just going to keep this for a moment just so I can kind of explain what we're doing. Um, so what I've asked Sonny to do is uh, just pick a tune. It could be a boogie, it could be a song, it could be whatever. Um, and we'll talk about it here in a second. But he's going to play, he'll be the leader, and I'm just going to sit behind and I'm going to comp and play things that will hopefully add to what he's doing. And, you know, for me, the biggest rule is the kind of the musician's uh, Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. <laughs> I, I would rather not play any note than play the wrong note, you know especially if I'm not being featured. So, um, yeah. So, and traditionally, when we do this, there, there, there's like two or three minutes when we look at each other and say, well, what do you want to play? I don't know, what do you want to play? Right. And so. And, 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 then we do, and then we do kind of what we're doing now. We're gonna say, okay, what are we gonna play? And then we'll talk about it. And this is what we call a rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> Whispering. 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 And I'll play some kind of an introduction that hopefully will make it obvious where Brian, you know, where I'm going. So we're starting in the same place.
Okay, so what I was doing basically a, a lot of the time was playing what I call like a trombone part. He's playing the melody and I'm kind of leading these tones. Thinking kind of orchestrally, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, that's what this music really is based on. It's based on, you know, the, the banjo and the, and the drum, the bass drum, and, you know, and check, and check, and check. And that's kind of, I mean, it's all instrumental music. So that's what we're doing with that. So I want to do one where you sing, okay. again, to kind of demonstrate what we do behind a vocalist. Yeah. Um, I was thinking we, Georgia? Yeah. Okay. It's a great Hoagie Carmichael tune, Georgia. Call the Nashville version of this, where one of the chords goes to a D. There's the original version that Hoagie wrote that actually goes to an E. So I was just verifying with him which one we're doing. Yeah, yeah and th th there are a number of tunes where it's worth having that discussion in the, the seconds before you actually commit yes. to. Uh, <laughs> uh. Oh, Georgia, oh, Georgia, the whole day through, it's just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. song of you comes drifting sweet and clear as moonlight through the pines moonlight through the pines other arms reach out to me other eyes smile take Peaceful dreams I see the road leads back to you, Georgia. Oh, Georgia, no peace I'd find, no peace I'd find. Just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind.
Just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. Lord, Georgia's on my mind. Okay, so again, there was a lot of communication happening there. I mean, we were talking back. He's telling me, he's like, oh, you take one? Okay, I'll take one. No, no, you take one. Okay. And then at the end, I, I knew when you came back and then sang that last phrase, okay, we're going out. So again, it's all about listening. It's all about understanding what he's planning on doing. Because, I mean, we, we could have gone on from there. But, I mean, it wouldn't make much sense at that point audibly to go, you know, sing it, play some rides, and then sing a part and then play more. No, I mean, it, it, made, it made sense to go out. So we both knew that what we were doing. So anyway, that, that was, that's again, just a, a demonstration of, of two musicians working together, communicating up here what's going on. Um, I do want to do one last tune to kind of demonstrate a little bit more of that because this one's going to have some key changes. Uh, we might even trade fours uh, or eights or twos or whatever. We'll, we'll figure that out when we get there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and this is this is one of those tunes that is, has some, well, some some twists and turns in it. So we'll just kind of play this by ear and see how it goes. Um, I want to thank you guys very very much for for being here, for supporting this contest, for supporting live music in general. Um, I, I often I, I always say thank you for supporting live music, but I always mean that in in every way possible. Uh, if you have a local school that puts on programs. Support them. Go. The kids love that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter if you have a kid there or not. Go, go see them. They love it. Um, theater stuff that happens in the, in the neighborhoods, um, usually it's minimal cost, and it means an absolute million bucks uh, to kids to look out and see an audience full of people. So go, go do that. Thank you guys again uh, for being here and for your kind attention. And uh, we're going to uh, attempt linger a while in a few keys. Here we go. <laughs> 